All right. So we're diving into Tinter today, huh? It's going to be fun. You've been digging into this whole world of building GYs with Python. It's a pretty cool world to dig into, yeah. Yeah, and we've got a stack of your notes and tutorials right here. Awesome. Ready to unpack all this and see what secrets we uncover. Yeah. You know, for anyone listening who might not be familiar, Tinter, it's all about making those visual interfaces, right? The mm -hmm. kind of thing you see on your screen when you open an app. Exactly. Think buttons, text boxes, drop downs, even those little progress bars that tell you how long something's going to take. Tinter's the tool that makes it happen in Python. Like, if Python code is the behind-the-scenes magic, to Tinter's how you let people actually interact with that magic. That's a great way to put it. It's about taking all that powerful Python logic and giving it a face, a user-friendly face. User-friendly, I like that. And one thing that really jumped out at me from, uh, from what I was reading is how Tinter seems to handle all those different operating systems. Yeah. Windows, Mac, Linux. Oh, yeah. Cross-platform compatibility is a huge plus with Tinter. So I could write my code once, mm -hmm. and it'll just work seamlessly everywhere. For the most part, yeah. It inherits this magic from the Tocake Toolkit, which it's built on. tocake has been around for ages, actually. Really? It was originally designed for a language called TCL, but it's found a really nice home within the Python world. Okay, so proven foundation adapted for modern use. Got it. But enough history, let's get our hands dirty. I saw some code snippets in here creating a simple window with ticker. Yeah, it's surprisingly straightforward. Surprisingly. I mean, I've dabbled a bit with GUI stuff before, and it can get complex fast. How few lines of code are we talking here? You can go from a blank script to a window popping up on your screen with like five, maybe six lines of Python. No way. All right, walk me through it. Import the library, obviously. Of course, got to have that input. Well, then you yeah. can create a window object, right? Exactly. It's like you're saying, hey, Tinter, I need a window to work with. And then... There was that geometry thing. That's for setting the size. Yeah, you can define the width and height of your window with that. And slap a title on it so we know what we're looking at. Exactly. Give it some personality. Okay, so we've got our basic window. Now what? Now comes the magic ingredient. Main loop. Main loop. The source called it the heart of the application. Why is it so crucial? Because without main loop, your window would just appear for a split second and then vanish. Poof. Gone. Like it never even yeah. existed. Exactly. It's what keeps your application running and listening for events. The events? Yeah, like when the user clicks a button or types something or even moves the mouse over the window. So main loop is basically playing traffic cop, directing all those user actions. You got it. It's the core of how GUIs actually work, this whole event-driven architecture. Okay, so we've got our window up and running. Our application's got a heartbeat thanks to that whole main loop thing, but it's still, you know, a little dot blank. A blank canvas isn't exactly inspiring for users, is it? You're not wrong. It's definitely missing some personality. And that's where widgets come in. Right. Widgets. The source mentioned those a lot. Buttons and text boxes and all that good stuff. Buttons, text fields, check boxes, radio buttons, sliders. The list goes on. Think of them as your building blocks for creating an actual interface. I saw they even had a color picker in there. Yeah. Pretty impressive. So with these widgets, we're moving beyond just basic functionality. Now we're talking about visual design, user experience, all that. Exactly. This is where you get to be creative, make your application visually appealing and intuitive for users to interact with. Okay, so let's say I've got all these widgets laid out. Well, I guess that's the next question, isn't it? Layout. How do you arrange all these buttons and things so they're not just scattered all over the place? Good point. You don't want your interface to look like a digital junk drawer. Right. That's where layout management comes in. The source mentioned a few options there. Grid, pack, place. Any of those ring a bell? Definitely. Chickenter gives you a few different ways to organize your widgets within the window. Each has its pros and cons depending on what you're trying to achieve. Grid is great for, well, grid-like layouts, rows and columns, nice and neat. Like a spreadsheet. Exactly. Pack is more about packing widgets together tightly. And place gives you really precise control over where each widget goes down to the pixel. Pixel perfect. So we're not just coders anymore. We're UI designers. But there was one thing in the source that really caught my eye databases. They mentioned using Ticken with MySQL and Squalite. Wait, are we saying you can build entire database applications with Tinter? You absolutely can, and this is where Tinter's real power starts to shine. Imagine building a tool to manage customer data or inventory, all with a clean, user-friendly interface that you build from the ground up. Hold on, so I could create, like, a mini CRM system or something using Tinter, manage contacts, track interactions, all within a GUI. 
That's way more than I realized Kinter could do. Yep. Kinter gives you the tools to interact with databases directly from your GUI. You can create forms for inputting data, display it in tables, even build in search functions, all within that same visual framework you've created. Wow. Okay, this is blowing my mind a little. I'm starting to see why people get so into Team Kinter. It really does seem like you can build almost anything with it. And speaking of building things, one last thing I wanted to clarify. The source mentioned something about creating a Windows EXE file from Kinter. What's that all about? Ah, uh, yes. That's about packaging up your application so other people can use it, even if they don't have Python installed on their computer. Oh, that's super handy. Yeah, tools like PyInstaller let you bundle everything up your Python code, the Kinter library, any other dependencies into a neat little executable file. So I could give someone a program I built with Kinter, they double click it, and it just works. Exactly. They don't need to install anything. They don't even need to know it's running on Python. It's like magic. So I could build something cool with Kinter, package it up with one of these tools, and share it with anyone. That's amazing. That's the power of Kinter, yeah. <laughs> you get the flexibility and power of Python working behind the scenes, but the end user gets a simple, user-friendly application. It's like you're giving away little pieces of Python magic. I like that. Okay, before we wrap things up, there's one more thing I want to touch on. It's something the source called After. I wasn't entirely sure what it was all about. Uh, after. Yeah, it sounded kind of technical. It's actually pretty straightforward. It's how Tinter handles things that happen over time within your app. Like imagine you want a countdown timer in your app, or maybe you want to display a message for a few seconds and then have it disappear automatically. Oh, okay. So it's about scheduling events to happen at specific times. Yeah, exactly. You give it a time delay in milliseconds and then tell it what function to execute after that delay. Hmm, interesting. It's really useful for things like animations, too. You can update the position of a widget every few milliseconds to make it look like it's moving smoothly across the screen. Oh, wow. I hadn't even considered animations. Yeah, there's a lot you can do. You could use After to build a simple clock that updates every second, for example, mm -hmm. or a reminder app that pops up notifications. Okay, you've convinced me. I need to spend some quality time with After. It's a fun one to play around with. It sounds like this deep dive was just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Kinter. Where would you suggest folks go from here if they want to really explore everything it can do? Honestly, the tutorials and notes you've got here are a really solid starting point. But the Tkinter world is vast. I bet. There are tons of fantastic resources, online tutorials, documentation, open source projects. Dive into the Tkinter documentation on the official Python website. That's always a good bet. And don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Experiment. Build something, even if it's something small. I love that. Don't be afraid to experiment and try things out. Exactly. Because honestly, sometimes the best way to learn is just to dive in and see what happens, break something, fix it. That's how you really figure out how things work. And who knows? Maybe you'll discover the next big thing in Kinter development. Exactly. Well, on that note, I think it's time for us to wrap up this Kinter deep dive. It's been a blast. It really has. Thanks for joining us. Anytime. And for everyone listening, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into Kinter. We hope you learned something new and feel inspired to create your own amazing Python GUIs. We'll be back soon with another deep dive, exploring a whole new topic just for you. Until then, keep coding, keep experimenting, and keep those creative sparks flying.